Welcome back to Rogue Darkness, the podcast that uncovers how the misinterpretations and misinformation surrounding witchcraft, the occult, and other beliefs have led many to do unthinkable crimes. From ritualistic killings and the demons that live in all of us, to exploration of the macabre and delving deep into the unknown, let's explore the darkness of mankind one crime at a time. I'm your host of The Grim and Gruesome, Raven. Let's go rogue and get right into today's chilling crime, the slew of murders carried out by Friedrich Heinrich Karl Harman, more commonly shortened to Fritz Harman, a man so notoriously vile that at the time of his death, he was known by many names, including the Wolfman, the Vampire of Hanover, or perhaps his most widely known title, the Butcher of Hanover. So now, let's start off from the very beginning. Traveling back in time to October 25th, 1879, Fritz Harman was born in Hanover, Germany, being the sixth and youngest child of his parents, Olli and Johanna Harman. Rumor has it that Olli Harman only married Johanna for her money. Johanna was 41 years old and seven years older than Olli when they wed. Johanna had a substantial dowry and was worried she wouldn't have many other opportunities to have a family of her own, so she rather reluctantly agreed to wed Olli but he was unfortunately not an ideal partner in many ways. Ali was known to have a bad temper and had several affairs throughout their marriage, even contracting syphilis from one of his mistresses. But despite his argumentative and authoritarian nature, and not to mention the numerous affairs, Johanna stuck by his side all the way up until her death in 1901. By the time she passed, Johanna and Ali had six children together, with many people claiming that her favorite child was her youngest son, Fritz. From a young age, Fritz was gentler than the other boys, and he reportedly loved spending time with his mother. He loved playing with his sister's dolls and learning how to sew. By the time Fritz began school in 1886, it was said that his teachers found him to be a rather spoiled child, who spent most of his time in class daydreaming and not actively listening or engaging in the classroom lessons. Because of this, Fritz did very poorly in school, where he had to repeat the same year three times because of his bad grades. And from there, things began to spiral downwards even more. When he was only eight years old, Fritz had been molested by one of his school teachers, which in turn caused him to take even less of an interest in school, turning inwards that much more and solely focusing on himself. Throughout his years, Fritz was known for always looking clean and put together, taking great pride in his outward appearance, with fashionable clothes and nice haircuts. And by 1894, he decided to drop out of school altogether in an attempt to try and make his way in the world, all on his own. While facing the world head-on, Fritz first became an apprentice for a locksmith all the way down in Neufbrissac, which is now a part of France, and it was quite some distance from Hanover where Fritz was from. During this time, Fritz quickly changed his mind about working under the locksmith, and he decided to start going to military school instead. Both of his parents had supported these decisions, and at first, it looked like military school was the fresh start that Fritz so desperately needed. Now in military school, Fritz did fairly well, and the strict, regimented schedule seemed to ground him. But, only five months in, Fritz was in trouble once again. But this time, it was not for the reasons you may have initially thought. What had first started as Fritz daydreaming and drifting off in class turned into something far more serious by the time he was 15 years old and active in military school. The problem started off with Fritz easily losing time, and sometimes he would even lose consciousness. Despite meeting with several medical professionals in an attempt to figure out the culprit of his issues, none of the doctors could determine what was actually wrong with him. Eventually, the doctors settled on a diagnosis of anxiety neurosis, which meant that Fritz would lose focus or even consciousness whenever he experienced high levels of anxiety or stress, a diagnosis being very similar to the symptoms experienced with epilepsy. One month after his diagnosis, Fritz decided to leave military school and then headed back to Hanover to be with his family. He briefly got a job working at the cigar company his father had founded using his mother's money, but within a year, Fritz began cementing the foundations for the legacy he would ultimately leave behind. Beginning at the young age of 16, 
Fritz began tricking young boys into following him to secluded areas where he would then proceed to sexually assault them. He got away with these vile acts for two years until he was arrested in 1896. But instead of jailing Fritz for his assaults and his homosexual activity, which at this period in time, homosexuality was actually illegal in Germany, the German authorities instead sent him to a mental institution where he would receive psychiatric evaluations to try and see why he was the way he was. A psychologist named Gerd Schmalfuss, who conducted his psychiatric evaluation, determined that Fritz was incompetent to stand trial, saying that he was incredibly deranged and advised that Fritz be sent to a mental institution indefinitely. The court agreed with and took the advice of Schmalfuss, and Fritz was then sent back to a mental institution to carry out his stay. Just seven months after he was placed into the institution, though, Fritz managed to escape, where his family aided him in fleeing to Switzerland, where he would live with some of their relatives. Fritz stayed in Switzerland up until 1899, when he went back to Hanover in an attempt to start his life over again. He assumed that by him being out of the country for the time he had, he hoped that people would have forgotten about him and the crimes he had committed. While back home in Hanover, Fritz met a woman named Erna Lauert, and they quickly became fond of one another, developing a romantic relationship, and then ultimately getting engaged when she became pregnant with Fritz's child. Although he had met a woman he loved and was about to have a baby, in 1890, Fritz was called in to do his mandatory military service and had to leave his family. This was the start of what Fritz would later describe as the happiest point in his life. During his service, his fellow soldiers had described Fritz as a great marksman who was always on his best behavior, but after a year into his service, there hadn't been any news about his child and his wife never attempted to contact him. Leaving him immensely distraught and angry, Fritz ended up collapsing during one of his military exercises. It turned out that Erna had secretly had an abortion while Fritz was on duty, and Fritz's condition had unfortunately been acting up on full force due to his stress levels, leading him to ultimately being honorably discharged from the military. Upon being discharged, Fritz was hospitalized for four months until the doctors came back with the diagnosis of the beginning stages of probable dementia. After receiving this new diagnosis, Fritz's life took a dive for the worse yet again. He returned to Hanover, this time with a monthly pension as a retired and injured veteran, and he tried to piece his life back together the best he could, reuniting with his wife and trying to make a successful life together. To try and resume a sense of normalcy, Fritz began by working at his father Ollie's cigar shop once more, but this attempt ultimately led to him and his father filing unsuccessful lawsuits against one another, with Ollie going as far as trying to get him institutionalized again, claiming Fritz was still mentally unstable. Fritz and his father ultimately came to a stalemate when Erna had became pregnant once again, and Ollie ended up helping set Fritz and Erna up with a business of their very own. Erna and Fritz opened a fishmongery where the couple worked together for some time, up until Fritz began accusing Erna of having an affair, which ultimately led to their separation. When initially setting up the business, Erna had been very careful with legalities and had put the fishmongery in her name, so when she ended up kicking Fritz out of the family home during their divorce, he was ultimately left with nothing. After his failed marriage, being left unemployed and without much more than a penny to his name, Fritz would end up spending the next 10 years on the wrong side of the law. Despite still maintaining his pension from his time served in the military, it wasn't enough for the lifestyle he ultimately wanted to live, and Fritz decided to make extra cash by stealing and selling stolen property. Fritz ended up spending most of 1905 through 1912 in and out of prison after being caught numerous times for his illegal activities. He was then sentenced to five years in prison in 1914, when he was arrested for, once again, a string of burglaries. When Fritz was released from prison in 1918, he made his way back to Hanover where it initially seemed like he had learned from his past mistakes. But instead of turning away from a life of crime completely as many had hoped, he decided to stick with it in a sense. But this time, he'd make himself more useful to the cops by aiding them in catching other criminals in hopes that the authorities would overlook his crimes. Fritz was known for going in and out of the police station whenever he pleased. He would oftentimes drop names and even assist the police with setting up raids, 
but he also had ulterior motives behind his actions. Fritz thought through everything he did very carefully, and ultimately used his interactions with the cops as a way to keep track of how closely they were monitoring him, and he had great reasoning for doing this. By 1918, Fritz's past sexual assaults and grim desires had evolved into something far more dark. Now, when he lured young boys back to his home, he wouldn't let them leave as he had in the past. Instead, he would attack them, bite down into their Adam's apple while simultaneously strangling them to death. Fritz was said to sometimes even bite all the way through his victims' necks, completely severing their tracheas, so they'd end up bleeding to death right before him. Fritz called this macabre act his love bite, and said that he performed this on every one of his victims before he would dismember the body and toss them into the river lane. Fritz's first known victim was a 17-year-old boy named Friedel Roth, who reportedly went missing one day, and Fritz took the initiative to write to Friedel's school to explain his absence, in an attempt to prevent them from raising an alarm. Due to his past assault and suspicions elevating at an ongoing rate, Fritz was ultimately arrested during a police raid of his home, and at that time the authorities found him in bed with a 13-year-old boy. Fritz would later say that at the time of his arrest, Friedel's head had been wrapped in newspapers and was hidden behind his oven, but at the time, he was only charged for sexual assault and battery of the 13-year-old boy that was discovered with him, and Fritz was then sentenced to serve nine months in prison. Before his sentencing was to take effect, though, Fritz, being the smooth talker he was said to be, managed to talk his way out of serving the sentence, remaining a free man, despite his ongoing criminal activity. During the next year, Fritz went on to meet an 18-year-old man named Hans Granz while patrolling his common hunting ground, the place where he would oftentimes spot potential victims, the Hanover Station. When they initially met, it's perceived that Hans was likely just another potential victim when Fritz invited him to stay at his apartment. Fritz noticed that Hans had been sleeping at the station and offered to let him stay with him for the time being. At first glance, Hans fit Fritz's usual target, he was a younger man, living on the streets with potentially no family to check up on him, or any relatives in close proximity that could report him missing. But, somehow Hans managed to warm his way into Fritz's heart, and they ended up being in a relationship. Hans wasn't a homosexual, though, but he slept with Fritz in return for a place to stay, and because he wanted to learn more about Fritz and the criminal enterprises he was involved in. He believed there was an opportunity at hand here, and he wanted to take advantage of it while he could. Soon, the pair had grown Fritz's business of selling stolen goods to now selling used clothes and trinkets, and Fritz seemed to have an endless supply of new inventory because of it. At the same time as their criminal progress, Hanover, on the other hand, had a record-breaking year for missing young boys and men. According to Fritz's later testimony, Hans walked into Fritz's apartment one day to find the body of one of his victims still sprawled out across their bed. But instead of going to the police or even looking afraid... Hans just asked Fritz when he should come back, and then he calmly left. This event marked the start of a relationship that was marred with death and violence, Hans even going as far as sometimes pointing out victims and ordering Fritz to kill them because he liked the clothes that they were wearing. Soon Fritz had 27 known victims, and despite the close eye Fritz had been keeping on the police to assure they weren't onto him, the authorities had already been honing in on him, tracing his steps whenever he frequented the station, and this would ultimately lead them to arresting him. Fritz didn't confess to anything when he was first arrested, but when the police told him that they'd found several of the victim's clothing within his apartment, in Hans' possession, and that they knew that both he and Hans had given away a lot of the victim's personal items as gifts, Fritz broke down and quickly began confessing to his crimes. Fritz later claimed that he had attacked a total of 50 to 70 victims, then advanced the number up to between 70 and 90, but when the authorities confronted him about his potential involvement with the 27 reported missing men, Fritz ultimately only confessed to 24 of them. When discussing his involvement with the victims, Fritz even went to the extent of telling the police, there are some that you don't know about, but it's not those you think. During his initial confession, Fritz didn't implicate Hans, who'd also been arrested in connection to the murders. But, after mounting pressure from the police, Fritz claimed that Hans had orchestrated some of the murders, and had even murdered some of the victims himself. 
Hans denied the charges against him, saying that he never had any idea that Fritz had been killing his victims, only that Fritz sold secondhand clothing. But despite his denial, the police didn't believe Hans and proceeded to take the duo to trial for sentencing. The two were then sent to trial where Fritz represented himself and both of them ultimately ended up pleading not guilty. Fritz would have had quite a solid case to plead not guilty by reason of insanity given his track record with mental institutions and his previous diagnosis, but because he chose to represent himself, he didn't file the paperwork correctly and he was found guilty of all 24 murders that he had previously confessed to. Hans too was found guilty as an accessory to murder and to the murder of the man whose suit he'd asked Fritz to obtain. The court determined that the two be sentenced to death by guillotine. Hans continued to appeal his case and his death sentence was ultimately commuted to serving 12 years in prison after Fritz had written a letter to Hans's father stating that Hans really didn't help Fritz murder the victims and that Fritz had only said that because the police had coerced him to do so. Hans ended up serving some of his time in a concentration camp following the end of the Second World War before he ended up returning to Hanover where he died in 1975. But unlike Hans, Fritz never appealed his death sentence. Instead, he seemed to welcome it. The press, who were by then in a media frenzy, were not allowed into the execution chamber, but official reports state that Fritz seemed pale and nervous as he walked up to the guillotine block. When he reached the guillotine, prepared to meet his maker, it's reported that Fritz nervously stated, I am guilty, gentlemen, but hard though it may be, I want to die as a man. I repent, but I do not fear death. As the last words left his lips, the swift blade of the guillotine beheaded him, marking the end of the trial that was dubbed the most revolting case in German criminal history. So that was the case of Fritz Harman, the man who went down in history as one of Germany's most feared killers, a man by many names, and who will forever be most commonly known as the Butcher of Hanover. Definitely let me know your thoughts on this case, and if you have any questions regarding it or any other cases I've previously covered, feel free to contact me at roguedarknesspod at gmail.com. You can also always reach out to me on my socials, Instagram and Twitter at rogue underscore darkness, on my website, roguedarkness.com. It'd be awesome if you could share the podcast with anyone who you think would like it, and be sure to leave a rating and review on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Good Pods, or any other platform where you can let other listeners know that you enjoy the show. I do currently have a sticker giveaway going on for anyone who leaves a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and all you have to do is take a screenshot of the review, send it my way, then I'll send you some stickers. It's as easy as that. And if you want some personalized shoutouts and other exclusives, definitely check out my Patreon by visiting patreon.com slash roguedarkness. You can also check out my bonfire shop if you want to get your hands on some merch to support the show even further. For references and additional information on the cases covered, you can find all of the links for everything discussed in my episodes down in the description box. And with that said, that concludes this week's episode of Rogue Darkness. The darkness is all around us, and I can confidently say that reality truly is more terrifying than fiction. Until next time.